that you are here today. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Our annual meeting is coming up on the 26th of January. If you are responsible for a report, I encourage you to get that in as uh, soon as possible. I'm going to call on uh, Cindy Schlink, one of the nominating committee members, to uh, share with you the nominations for offices. On behalf of the nominating committee, which consists of Philip Dywood, Holly Westlake, and me, in preparation for the annual congregational meeting to be held on Wednesday, January 26th at 6.30, we present the following candidates. President, Rudy Rapshaw. Vice President, Kyle Westlake. Treasurer, Aaron Johnson. Congregational Meeting Secretary, Mary Jo Dywood. Deacon, Wayne Flohn. Trustees, Dwight Horsberg and Roger Benson. Head Usher, John Crellin. Music and Worship, Angela Hansen. There are also some responses still pending. Please be in prayer for the meeting, the elections, and decisions to take place. And we thank God for guiding and using his people to accomplish his purposes for his kingdom. Thank you, Cindy. If you've ever been on the nominating committee, you know that is a job that takes some work and we're thankful for uh, those who are serving us in this way. Our call to worship today comes from the 40th Psalm. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He has put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are the only one who can deliver us, rescue us from the miry clay. Thank you that you have sent Jesus to be our Savior, to free us, to save us, to give us life. And we come, Lord, this morning to worship you and praise you and thank you for who you are and for all that you have done for us. And Lord, we pray that our worship today would be pleasing in your sight. We come in Jesus' name, and I pray that our worship would be in spirit and in truth, and that his name would receive all the glory and all the praise. For we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able this morning as we begin our worship service.
Today's scripture reading comes from Hebrews 12, verses 4 through 11. Again, Hebrews 12, 4 through 11. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the extortion that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who had disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have tr been trained by it. Here ends our scripture reading. The confession of sin comes from Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5. It can be found in your bulletin and on the screen. When I kept silent about my sin... My body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. In my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Isn't that one a wonderful promise? When we confess our sins to the Lord, He will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I invite you to stand again as we continue to worship and sing of that great love of our God.
you to join together as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Invite the ushers forward as we worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. You can be seated. Thank you. 
recognize that song. It's all about you, Jesus, and not about me. I hope that's the cry of our heart this morning, that our worship would be about him, nothing of ourselves, but that he would receive all the honor and glory and praise as we behold our God through the reading of his word, through the preaching of his word, and the singing. Before our message, I invite you to stand one more time as we sing that, Behold Our God.
Father, that's what we're here to do today, to come and behold you, to adore you, to worship your holy name, Lord. And I pray that we would do that this morning in spirit and in truth, and that your name would be lifted high. Pray that you speak to us through your word this morning. Your word is truth. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Back in the early 1960s, when I was a child, the denomination that our congregation was a part of began to drift spiritually. And one of the ways we saw that was the Sunday school material. Two things I remember as a child. One was that they did not believe any longer that Adam and Eve were actually real people, just kind of symbols of creation or something like that. And then the other thing that they said they didn't believe anymore is that Jonah was actually swallowed by a fish. That was just a myth. I remember my dad telling about a man who was sitting in a church service and the preacher was preaching on the book of Jonah and he made the statement, he said, we don't really believe this anymore, that uh, Jonah was swallowed by a fish. And there was a man who stood up while the pastor was preaching and said, Pastor, I beg to differ with you. He said, if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the fish, I'd believe it. Why? Because of his confidence in the truth of God's Word. Jesus himself said that Jonah was swallowed by a fish. So, who are you going to believe? Are you going to stand with the liberal, so-called scholars of our day, or are you going to stand with Jesus? I stand with Jesus. I stand in his word. And we come then to chapter 2 of Jonah. Jonah has been swallowed by that fish. Running to God. In chapter 1, he was running from God. Now in the belly of the fish, he's running to God. In Genesis 2, we begin at verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish, and he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice. For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I've been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Let's pray. Father in heaven, these are words that you have given by the inspiration of your Spirit. We believe that your word is truth. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, would be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Put yourself in Jonah's shoes for a moment. Can you imagine what it would be like to be in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. Now, obviously, it must have been a very stinky place, I would assume. I don't know how else to describe it other than that way. It must have been a very frightening experience. But God knew that Jonah needed that. You see, the storm that God sent upon the sea that caused the ship just about to break up didn't really get Jonah's attention. But being thrown overboard and swallowed by that fish 
I think Jonah was ready to, to listen, though. R.T. Kendall says, the belly of the fish is not a happy place to live, but it is a good place to learn. And I would suggest to you that there are several things that Jonah learned as he spent that time in the belly of the fish. First of all, Jonah realized his need. He realized his need. As we come to chapter 2, Jonah is finally on his knees. For the first time in his trouble, he prayed. And that's interesting because in chapter 1, verse 6, he was asleep in the belly of the ship, right? And the captain of the ship had to tell him to pray. He said, how is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. But in that ship, we don't have any record of Jonah praying. The first record of him praying is what we find in chapter 2, in the belly of the fish, that's when he finally started to pray. Verse 1, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. One commentary says the significance of this verse is found in Jonah's willingness to pray. From a near drowning experience, he awakened to find himself in a terrifying environment. We don't know how long Jonah was in the fish before he prayed. I would like to know that. Maybe someday we'll find out. How long were you in that fish before you actually started to pray? Was it right away? Or did you wait? Were you still stubborn? No doubt, the author says, he found his entire experience in the sea overwhelming that this prophet of few words finally prayed marks a turning point in the book. And it certainly is, right? Because that's where things change. That's the turning point. When we are in the midst of whatever it is we face and we get down on our knees and pray, that's the turning point. And if you never get to the turning point, you're going to be in trouble. Facing the challenges of life alone, or on your knees in prayer. I think it's wise that you get down on your knees and pray. Now, as you read through this prayer, uh, Jonah expresses in various ways that, like we would say, he had hit bottom, right? He had hit bottom. And notice all the, the references to that. Verse 2, he says, I called out in my distress to the Lord. He answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. Verse 3, for you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea. All your breakers and billows passed over me. Verse 5, water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Verse 6, I descended to the, to the roots of the mountains, the, the very depths of the sea. And then he says at the end of verse 6, but you have brought up my life from the pit. So all of those expressions really describe that, that here's a man that had finally hit bottom. Right? And you look at people and you think, you know, they go through struggles and trials and you think, finally they've hit bottom. Oh, no, no, no. Go back to their sin. Finally they've hit bottom. No, no, no. It's just like this cycle going on and on. Finally, Jonah hit bottom. So deep was the pit that Jonah had figured he had been banished from the sight of God. Verse 4, he said, I have been expelled from your sight. That's how bad it seemed. There was no hope. He was in the pit and there was no way he was going to get up. Ever felt that way? Ever felt like you were in a pit and you wondered if you would ever get out? My wife experienced that one time when, when she was with her brother Larry and they were uh, walking in the field of mud and she sunk into a six-inch pit. Well, for a child, that was deep because her feet were literally stuck. And as a little girl, she started to cry, right? Her brother said, don't worry, Judy. I'll go get 
dad and he'll pull you out with a tractor. <laughs> That'd be quite a deliverance, huh? I think she got scared enough that before her brother got back, she pulled herself out of that pit, that six-inch pit. There are times when we feel like we're stuck. We feel like we're in a situation that, am I ever going to get out of this? Will things ever change? Will it ever be different? And I know some of you have experienced that in a very significant way in the last few years. It's a pit. It's a challenge. Now, it's interesting to notice how Jonah's prayer includes a number of quotations from the Psalms. Now, one author says that parallels to Jonah chapter 2 can be found in Psalm 3, Psalm 5, Psalm 18, Psalm 31, Psalm 42, Psalm 69, Psalm 77, Psalm 116, and Psalm 120. If you're counting, which I don't assume you were, that's nine different psalms. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? What does that say? I think that tells us that, that, that Jonah had knowledge of the Word of God. And as he prayed to God, he was praying Scripture. Do you ever pray Scripture to God? I think that's the best way to pray. Because we are taking His Word, His promises, and we are bringing them before the throne of God. Does God hear His Promises? <laughs> Absolutely. And that's what Jonah did. I don't think there's a better way to pray in time of need than to pray the Scriptures. Now, do you realize your need for God today? Let me tell you, you don't need to be in the belly of a fish to realize your need. We need Jesus every day, right? Every single moment of every single day, we need Jesus, and we have the privilege to come to Him in prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. You can finish it, can't you? What a privilege to carry. Do you consider that a privilege? If you were in the belly of a fish, you would consider that a privilege, wouldn't you? But you have other needs. I know you do, because you're human. You have things in your life, maybe things in your family, things in your relationship that need prayer, right? We recognize our need. We come to Him in prayer. So this is the first thing. Jonah realized his need. The second thing we notice is that Jonah recognized God's discipline. Did you notice how he describes being cast into the deep in verse 3? He says to the Lord, For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the currents engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So instead of saying that the sailors threw me overboard, which they did, right? Instead of saying that the sea covered me with all of its breakers, what does Jonah say? God, this is your work. This is your discipline. He saw what he was going through as God's discipline in his life. Luther said Jonah felt in his conscience that the sea with its waves and billows was the servant of God and of his wrath to punish him. And I find it very fascinating when you read through the book of Jonah, you notice how God was actively involved in this man's life. We go back to chapter 1. The Lord hurled a great wind. Verse 17, the Lord appointed a great fish. Chapter 4, the Lord God appointed a plant. Chapter 4, verse 7, God appointed a worm. Chapter 4, verse 8, God appointed a scorching wind. And so there was no question in Jonah's mind that he was at this point in his life being disciplined by God for his rebellion. The wind, 
the plant, the, the fish, the, the scorching wind, all of that came from the hand of God. You know, sometimes I wonder if we have a little trouble recognizing God's hand of discipline. What do you think? Bad luck? Misfortune? Or maybe a more spiritual one, well, we live in a fallen world, you know, which is true, right? When trouble comes our way, I think we need to at least ask, are you trying to tell me something, Lord? Are you trying to get my attention in some way? Is what I'm going through your hand of discipline upon me? It may not be. But I think we need to be sensitive to what happens in our life and say, okay, Lord, is there something you want to teach me here? And if what I'm experiencing is God's discipline, if God makes that clear to us, then we need to submit to that, right? Say, okay, Lord, you're accomplishing something in my life. Hebrews 12 was read from this morning for our scripture reading. Warren Wiersbe says this about that passage. He says, how we respond to discipline de determines how much benefit we receive from it. According to Hebrews 12, we have several options. We can despise God's discipline and fight, verse 5. We can be discouraged and faint. We can resist discipline and invite stronger discipline. Or we can submit to the Father and mature in faith and love. So how we respond to discipline really determines how much we learn through it, right? Can you remember times when you were young and you were disciplined by your mom or dad and you did not like it one bit? Huh? Unfair or why, why can't I do this? Or, you know... The younger brother, you know, he, I mean, there's all kinds of ways that we say, you know, I'm not going to learn from this. I'm going to bow my neck. And sometimes it's that way with the Lord too, right? We don't fight it. We need to submit to it. And, and Jonah recognized that, that, that all of this that was happening in his life was, was the discipline of God. But thirdly, in the midst of that, Jonah was renewed in his hope for deliverance. There was a time while he was in the fish that, that he wondered if there was any hope. He said, I've been expelled from your sight. But notice what he says at the end of verse 4. He says, nevertheless, in spite of this, nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Hope being renewed. I found that expression to be interesting because I think there's some Old Testament background to, to this looking again toward God's temple. It's kind of, well, when you think about it, Jonah's hope was renewed First of all, because he had been swallowed by the fish. Had he not been swallowed by that fish, what would have happened? He would have drowned. Eventually, he, he would have died. So, so Jonah must have seen the fish not only as a means of discipline, but also as a sign of God's mercy. One author says that he now found himself alive, even in so terrifying an environment, Jonah took to be a miracle of God intended as the means of his eventual deliverance. The fish was a beneficent device for returning Jonah to the place of his commission. Another reason Jonah's hope was renewed because he believed the promise of God. And here we go back then into the Old Testament in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And here is when Solomon was dedicating the temple that he had built. Second Chronicles 6, verse 18, he says, But will God indeed dwell with mankind on earth? 
Behold, heaven and the highest heavens cannot contain you, how much less this house that I built. In other words, you know, you're not confined to this place. But then he goes on to say this, Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to listen to the cry, to the prayer of which your servant prays before you, and your eye may be open toward this house. Looking toward this house day and night, toward the place which you have said you would put your name there, to listen to the prayer which your servant shall pray toward this place. Listen to the supplications of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Notice how he emphasizes that, looking toward this place. Place, looking to this place where, God, your presence is made known. King Jehoshaphat did the same thing. Second Chronicles 20, verse 9, he says, Should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house. And before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and deliver us. I can't help but think that that's what was in in Jonah's mind. That dedication of that temple, and when King Jehoshaphat was, was doing, looking toward this place. And that's the confidence we can have. When God is working in our lives to get our focus on Him, we can trust that He will hear us when we call out to Him, when we look to Him. That's where our hope for deliverance comes from, from the Lord. Jonah was serious, I believe, about this prayer because the fourth thing we notice is that Jonah recommitted himself to God. Although his prayer was a cry for deliverance, it was more than that. Jonah's prayer was also a prayer recommitment. Look at verse 7 through 9. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. What vow do you think Jonah is talking about here? That which I have vowed I will pay. Some suggest it could be his Vow as a prophet, maybe, when a pastor is ordained, right, there are vows made, I vowed to be faithful to the Word of God, right? Or it could be a vow that Jonah made in the belly of the fish. Now, can you imagine that happening? Ever been in a situation where you prayed, Lord, If you get me out of this, I will fill in the blank. Huh? Ever prayed that? Well, I can imagine Jonah praying that. Lord, if you get me out of this stinky fish, I'll go to Nineveh. And he went, not so joyfully, but but he did go. And you know what? God takes our vows seriously, doesn't he? We've been studying the book of Ecclesiastes on Wednesday night. In chapter 5, it says, When you make a vow to God, don't be late in paying it. He takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It's better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. And he says, Do not let your speech cause you to sin. And do not say in the presence of the messenger of God, Oh, it was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. Or I didn't really mean that vow. God says, that, that, we, don't, we don't accept that. that. That's foolish to make a vow. God, if you get me out of this, I'll do that. And then as soon as you're out of trouble, you forget about your commitment to God. Evidently, Jonah took his vow seriously. 
because he says, that which I vowed, I kept. Recommitting to, to God. The final thing we noticed in this chapter then is that Jonah rejoiced in God's salvation. If you find yourself in the midst of a crisis like Jonah, you need to know where you can turn, right? You need to know who you can count on to save you. Now, Jonah learned what he couldn't count on, right? Because when he was in that boat with those sailors, they were crying out to their gods, every one of them, right? What happened? These gods didn't answer. Why? Gods of wood, gods of stone, they can do absolutely nothing for you. And so Jonah realized that there's no way any of these false gods will help him. And that's why he says in verse 8, those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. Jonah knew who he could count on, didn't he? He knew he could count on the Lord, and that's why he finished this prayer in verse 9 by saying very simply and very powerfully, salvation is from the Lord. Deliverance is from the Lord. And some have suggested that, that this is really the theme of the book of Jonah, because it, because it was only the Lord who could save the sailors from the storm. It was only the Lord who could save Jonah from the belly of the fish. It was only the Lord who could save the people of Nineveh. That really is the theme of the whole book, isn't it? Salvation comes from the Lord. No other place. No other place. Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. That's the theme of the book of Jonah. Salvation comes only from the Lord. We need to embrace that, and we need to proclaim that. Jesus is our only hope. So what was God's response to Jonah's prayer? Well, some have suggested he gave the fish an upset stomach. Verse 10, then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Not the most pleasant picture, is it? I think I would rather have my arm cut off than to vomit. I just do not, well, that's probably just an exaggeration, but any of you have no, no, no problems with throwing up? Huh? I, I, that's the worst, isn't it? It's just like, oh, man, give me a headache, but don't have me throw up. I was shopping at Costco a few years ago. Just, you know, walking down the aisles looking. And all of a sudden, I heard behind me the sound of someone. It was, it was loud. It was like, Aah! and I was waiting for the, you know, the slap. And so I turned around and looked. It was a lady I know. I said, how could you do that to me? You just about made me sick now because of there's something horrible about vomiting. Huh? Well, in Jonah's case, that was a blessing. God gave that fish an upset stomach, and Jonah was spewed out of the mouth of that fish, and he was delivered, joyfully delivered. But have you been joyfully delivered? Delivered from the pit of, of sin? Delivered from a hopeless situation where there was not anything you could do to save yourself? Salvation is a miracle. It is the work of God. We don't climb the ladder into heaven. It's only as God reaches down to us 
And in His mercy and grace, He he delivers us. Oh, the joy of deliverance. Salvation is from the Lord. Jesus is your only hope of deliverance. And when you call on Him, He will save you. He will deliver you. He'll bring you out of that pit of sin. Put a new song in your heart. Many will see a change in your life. There will be some of them who are going to say, I want what you have. I don't know what it is that you have. Whatever it is, I need that kind of joy, that kind of peace, that kind of forgiveness, that kind of hope that is found in, in, in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this chapter as we see Jonah running to you recognizing his need for you, uh, crying out to you, and, and in your mercy and grace, experiencing that joy of deliverance. Oh God, may that be a part of our lives today. May that be a part of the, ones, the lives of the ones we love. That you would rescue, that you would save, that you would deliver from the pit. In Jesus' name we pray. I'd like you to stand as we close this morning singing, Jesus Loves Even Me. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when on his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I'm so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves even me. Jesus loves even me. That, that, that's quite a thought, isn't it? When you, when you think about who we are, we, we know our own hearts, how we've sinned think that Jesus loves even me. That is so, such good news today. and We need to rejoice in that. that. He has delivered us by his grace and mercy. Jesus loves even me. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.